continuing with the representation theory of finite groups, we move from the abelian case to the non-abelian case. Recall, our goal is to describe an analog of Fourier analysis on the circle group. We'll have two main themes. First, for functions on our finite group, we want to use the irreducible unitary representations to get a version of Fourier series. On the other hand, I want to use this entire set of functions to capture all irreducible unitary representations of G in a certain sense. Now, let's recall the big picture for the abelian case. I start with L2 of G. This is the set of all functions from our group to the complex numbers. Because G is finite, this is a finite dimensional vector space. I use the notation L2 of G just to indicate that we have a Hermitian inner product here. So if we have two functions f and h, I can define their inner product as follows. So here, we're taking some sort of averaging operation. Now, to get representation theory into the picture, I have two actions on L2 of G. We can act on functions by group element by acting on the variable on the right, or we could act on the variable by the group element on the left. Okay, and just note if you're going to act on the left, you have to put in an inverse to get a representation. Using either group action, we obtain a unitary representation of G on L2 of G. The following statements capture the relation between the functions on G and the irreducible unitary representations on G precisely. If we take all irreducible characters of G, so these are the one-dimensional representations, they form an orthonormal basis of L2 of G. So if we take any function on the group, we could write it as a linear combination of irreducible characters. Because the irreducible representations of G are all irreducible characters, we have at the level of group representations that L2 of G as a representation space decomposes as an orthogonal direct sum of irreducible representations, all of them occurring and each occurring with multiplicity one. Then we have using the orthonormal basis property, okay, I write F as a linear combination of irreducible characters. We have Fourier's trick for getting the coefficients. Then we have Parseval's identity for describing the norm squared of our function as a sum of the norm squared of the coefficients. Okay, these formulas here respect the group actions. We could try the same approach when G is not abelian, but there aren't enough irreducible characters to describe every function on G. For instance, if G is simple and not abelian, such as the alternating group on five letters, then the only irreducible character is the trivial one. In general, the number of irreducible characters is equal to the order of the group G mod commutator subgroup of G. Now, G is simple and non-abelian. The commutator subgroup is a normal subgroup, so it must be equal to G in this case, and then we have only one element here. That's going to be our trivial character. So the question is, how do we fix this? If we have irreducible representations with dimension greater than one, how do we get functions from them? Well, if we have one of these representations, say pi, we choose a basis for the vector space, we'll have a map then from pi, going from our group, into the invertible n by n matrices. If we focus this map on one row and one column, so a single entry in the matrix, and let g vary, that's going to give us a function of g. Call such a function a matrix coefficient. Now, in general, okay, our definition, of pi v, a unitary representation of g, we're to fix a u and v in our vector space, then we're going to define a function as so. And that's what we're going to call a matrix coefficient of our representation. Now, if we have a representation already realized on Cn, if I choose the standard basis, E sub i, then this matrix coefficient here, where I have 
first slot EI, second slot EJ. That's going to pick off the J ith entry of pi G. For here, consider only the first step to Fourier analysis. This result is the short orthogonality relations. We take two irreducible unitary representations, pi v, sigma w, form a matrix coefficient for pi, a matrix coefficient for sigma, take the inner product. If pi and sigma are inequivalent, we get zero. Pi and sigma are equal, we get this expression. Pi and sigma are equivalent, we get this expression but we need to put in the equivalence map in the correct places. The first time we see this result, this seems a bit mysterious. So let's first focus on consequences of the relations, and then we'll take a look at the proof. Now, if I have a set of inequivalent irreducible unitary representations, I could form their matrix coefficient spaces. Then by part one, these matrix coefficient spaces are mutually orthogonal subspaces of L2 of G. If we further focus on just one of these matrix coefficient spaces, so say for the irreducible unitary representation pi V, if we have an orthonormal basis for V given by U sub I, then we'll have corresponding orthonormal basis for the matrix coefficient space. Now, using one and two, as we go over all inequivalent irreducible unitary representations, we get an orthonormal set in L2 of G, and we'll see later that orthonormal set is actually an orthonormal basis. Here's one way to go about the proof. We pass from the representation space to the matrix coefficient space. We should think of this as being implemented by a matrix coefficient map. So this map is going to take two vectors, u and v, but we should think of that pair as being a single vector in the tensor product of v with the dual of v. So little v should be thought of as a dual vector. Then we have this outline. First thing we know, if I take the tensor product of pi with the dual of pi, it's not an irreducible unitary representation of G, but if we take the outer tensor product, we have an irreducible unitary representation of G product with G. Then we note that on this space, pi is going to intertwine the actions of, okay, we have the right action tensor with the left action on L2 of G, and we have pi tensor with pi star on our tensor product here. Then we note if we have an invariant Hermitian inner product or an irreducible representation, that's unique up to a scalar. So what we're going to show is we have invariant Hermitian inner product, invariant Hermitian inner product, and then the work is figuring out what the scalar is. For the second item, the intertwining property. It's enough to verify on matrix coefficients and then extend linearly. If we apply an element of G cross G to a matrix coefficient and follow the definitions, first we have the definition of the group action on functions. I can use the definition of matrix coefficient to rewrite. And then we can separate out the group elements from our variable. This allows us to rewrite this as phi applied to an element of our tensor product evaluated at x. Here we have the correct action for group elements on dual vectors. So this is just the group action for the tensor product. So that gives us our intertwining property. Now, our domain space is an irreducible representation of G cross G. So Schur's lemma applies, which means phi is either zero or an equivalence up to a scalar with the image. Now, it's non-zero because all I need to do is check that one of these vectors is non-zero. So if I take the matrix coefficient of u with u applied to the identity element, we get the norm of u squared. So if I take any non-zero u, we're going to have a non-zero matrix coefficient. So that means equivalence up to scalar. 
for the vanishing result, pi and sigma are inequivalent as irreducible representations of g. This means the corresponding tensor products are inequivalent as irreducible representations of g cross g. Schur's lemma says the only invariant sesquilinear pairing we can have in these spaces is the zero pairing. That's our first part. For the vanishing result, we have by the equivalence, the matrix coefficient space is an irreducible g cross g representation. If we put two invariant Hermitian interprocs on this space, they have to be equal up to a scalar. For one, we have the invariant Hermitian or product coming from L2 of G. We also have the one coming from the tensor product. So the natural invariant Hermitian or product here is given as follows on monomials, and then we extend. Main thing to note here, for the pairing on dual vectors, we're using the isomorphism between the dual representation and the complex conjugate representation. So that's why the bar comes in. To compute our constant C, let's choose an orthonormal basis U sub i of our vector space V. We consider the following sum. If V was Cn and our basis was the standard basis of Cn, this expression is just the length squared of the first column in pi of g. But since pi of g is unitary, that's equal to 1. Now, let's just compute to see that. First, we're going to write out our matrix coefficients by the definition. I can reverse the order here by the Hermitian property. Then, I'm going to take these terms and move them into the first slot. So, that's going to give us just a fancy expression for pi g applied to u1. By the invariance property, we can remove the pi g's, and I'm left with the length squared of u1, which is equal to 1. Now, if I consider this sum of inner products here, previous computation says we're just going to apply 1 over the order of g, sum of 1, and that's equal to 1. I can compute in another way using the Hermitian inner product on V tensor with V star. So that's just going to be given by this expression here. We note, okay, by definition, we put the U1s together, we put the UIs together with a bar. So we have a 1 here, I have a 1 here, and then we're going to sum over I. So we're going to have D sub pi of these we're calling d sub pi the dimension of v. So that means our constant is going to be equal to 1 over the dimension of our representation. For an example, consider S3 the symmetric group on three letters. S3 has three inequivalent irreducible representations, a trivial representation, a sign representation, and an irreducible two-dimensional representation. For the two-dimensional representation, if I consider symmetries of an equilateral triangle, centered at the origin and R2, then each of these symmetries induces a linear transformation in R2. And with the choice of the standard basis, we get the following matrices. Now, when we set the table for the matrix coefficients, I start in the upper left-hand corner and work my way down the columns to get values. So, Choosing orthonormal bases for each of our representations. For the trivial representation, we're going to have one evaluated at each point. For the sign representation, it's going to be one at each point, except for the two cycles where we get minus ones. Then for our two-dimensional representation, I have four matrix coefficients. Okay, we work down the columns as I noted before. So we have, for instance, this one, zero, zero, one. 1, 0, 0, 1, and then we repeat as follows as we work our way to the right. Two things to note about our table. If I forget about this last column, the rows will be orthogonal. And if I take the sum of the squares of the entries in a row, divide by 6, the number of elements in our group, we get 1 over the dimension of the representation. 
So you should confirm both of those facts. Another fact about our table, we have that the dimension of L2 of S3 is equal to six. Okay, S3 has six elements. Our table has an orthogonal set of six elements. That means we have an orthogonal basis for L2 of S3. This will hold in general. If we want to make it an orthonormal basis, we just multiply each matrix coefficient by the square root of the dimension. With that exercise, we define two functions as follows. First one will have one on cycles one, two, three, and one, three, two, zero otherwise. For our second function, we'll have one on our two cycles and zero otherwise. We want to use Fourier's trick to write our functions as linear combinations in terms of the orthonormal basis. Another exercise, work out the matrix coefficient tables for D4, the symmetry group of the square, and the quaternion group. So in each case, we're going to have eight matrix coefficients. Now, some follow-up. If we have a unitary representation pi v of our group, I'm just going to call the character of G the following function. So we're just going to take our representation and then take its trace. Now, if we have an orthonormal basis, I can rewrite the trace as this sum here. Note, when we have a one-dimensional representation, this notion of character is going to coincide with our notion of character before as a one-dimensional unitary representation. Now, we also have short orthogonality relations for characters. So these follow immediately from our usual short orthogonality relations applied to our second part of the definition. So if we have pi and sigma irreducible, inner product of their characters is equal to zero if they're inequivalent. It's equal to one if they're equivalent. A final fact about characters for now. Characters are constant on conjugacy classes. So if we take an element x of our group, conjugate by the element g, if we apply our character to this element, I can expand using the homomorphism property. Then by the trace, we can move this term to the front and the g's cancel. So we get the character evaluated at our original element x. A final example, character table for S3. Here, for our columns, we're only going to list one element from each conjugacy class, and then we'll weight our columns by the number of elements in each class. As before, if we ignore the last column, then our rows are going to be orthogonal, okay, as long as we weight our sum. And for the last column, this just says if I take the sum of the squares of the entries, okay, weighted in a given row, we divide by six, the number of elements in the group, we get one. So final exercise, find the character tables for D4, symmetry group of the square, and the quaternion group.